Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second virtual speaker series of the year. Um, we are going to be hearing from our very own Boppin Bailey George. He's one of our Radio Bristol DJs, who will be talking to us about Before Coal Miners' Daughters and Many Colored Coats, Pioneering Women in Country Music. This is going to be a great talk to just learn about some of those little-known women who had big impact. Um, we really appreciate you being here with us. We've had a few little technical difficulties, so we're actually gonna be merging into Bailey's talk about two minutes in, so you just missed the very beginning of it, but you'll get the majority of it there. We hope you enjoy it. Thank you. It's known as the big bang of country music. And one of the things that, the reasons we call it the big bang of country music is it's because it's one of the first times that country music is shown to have crossover appeal. And that's in Jimmy Rogers and the Carter family. People that wouldn't usually buy country records are buying country records. And that's why we call that the big bang of country music, because from there, record companies uh, basically put money into recording um, old time music or country music. But before that, you know, we all know about the famous Bristol Sessions and we all know about the Carter family, which, um, of course, Sarah and Maybell and A.P. Carter, we know them very well here at the Birthplace Country Music Museum. But if we back up a few years to 1924, there's some debate over which is the very first country record. Some people say it's a fellow named Eck Robertson from uh, Texas. Um, but for the most part, a lot of people agree that it's um, a recording called Little Old Log Cabin in the Lane, which was a Tin Pan Alley song that was recorded by a fellow named Fiddlin' John Carson in Atlanta in 1924. Ralph Peer, the man who put together the Bristol Sessions here in Bristol, um, also was the person to record Fiddlin' John Carson when he worked for the OK Company. And he had had success recording female blues musicians um, like Bessie Smith and Mamie Smith. And while he was down south looking for uh, people to record, he recorded Fiddlin' John Carson. And right after that, right after that, he records a group, um, an another Atlanta group, Gid Tanner and Riley Puckett, who went on to uh, form the Skillet Liquors and a very popular string band in the 1920s. Right after that record is made, there is a group of um, a female string band is what they you know, see them referred to as. But um, Eva Davis and Samantha Bumgarner uh, record a record called Big Eyed Rabbit, a fiddle instrumental. And on the flip side, Eva Davis sings a ballad song um, with three finger banjo, uh, old time banjo. Um, this is about 15 years before Earl Scruggs would make a record with three finger banjo, by the way, um, recording of a song called Wild Bill Jones, which was a famous mountain ballad. Um, that is among the very first handful of country records to be recorded. And they record um, about six sides, I think, around six sides um, at that uh, first recording session. And so from there, country music, those records sell out anywhere there, any furniture store that they're placed in, those records sell out. They're extremely popular. And so record companies take the time to start recording country music, which eventually leads Ralph Peer to Bristol. And, um, you know, if you've gone through the museum, you know the story of the Bristol sessions and all that. And I won't go into too much here. And um, I do want to make a note of the Carter family because they are, of course, very influential. But, uh, you know, we know enough about the Carter family. We've gone, you know, we've especially if you live in this region, you've definitely um, heard the Carter family and you know about them. So let's take a second here to think about what's going on in the broader entertainment industry of around 1927, around the time of the Bristol Sessions. Radio in particular is take, starting to take off. And when the stock market crashes 
in 29 and the Great Depression comes in, radio is going to be even more important than records to getting music um, distributed to mass markets. And one of the things that happens is tons of these little radio stations pop up around the country and everybody suddenly is fascinated with the idea that you can get music for free into your home and, you know, not only music, but, you know, the greatest entertainers that you would have never, if you were in a small town, say in Appalachia, you would have never had access to these big name entertainers like Burns and Allen or Jack Benny or um, people like that. But now with radio, you can have them in your living room. People who were huge on vaudeville stages can now reach audiences that would have never otherwise have had the opportunity to see them or hear them. And so what happens is like the recording industry, these Radio stations have all this airtime now that they have to fill up with something. So let's think about um, let's think about now Chicago. And Chicago is not a place that you usually think about when you think of a hub of country music. But in 1924, there's a fellow there named George D. Hay, who was a newspaper columnist who starts to. Uh, he, went, he goes to a square dance one night, and he, uh, and while he's at that square dance, he's thinking, wow, this music's pretty good. I think we should put it on the radio. Well, he does. It just so happens that WLS, which stands for World's Largest Store, because the radio station was owned by Sears, WLS in Chicago puts on a program called the WLS Barn Dance, and that show is immediately takes off. It's insanely popular. And so WSM in Nashville takes note of this and they hire George D. Hay to come down to Nashville and start a program to rival the show that he started in Chicago. That show was originally called the WSM Barn Dance. And then later in around 1928, it becomes the Grand Ole Opry. So in the meantime, in Chicago, you have this insanely popular radio program called the National Barn Dance. And in the early part of country music, you could make the argument that the National Barn Dance was more important to the, at least the birth of country music than, as we know it today, than the Grand Ole Opry was. And so I'm giving you all that context just to um, introduce um, the first person that we're going to talk about today, and I'm going to share a little PowerPoint here so you can uh, get some pictures here, and I hope everybody can can see that. Um, and uh, should come up here. So if everyone can see um, Lula Bell Wiseman on the screen right now, um, there is a girl from the mountains of North Carolina who sings these beautiful ballads. And it also so happens that she has this infectious personality on the radio that a lot of country performers early on did not have. Um, Lula Bell Wiseman was from the mountains around Boone. And she uh, had grew up singing these mountain ballads and everything and decided to go to Chicago and be on this program that was taking the country by storm called the National Barn Dance. By this time, it had changed names from the WLS Barn Dance to the National Barn Dance because it was so popular. And she gets hired on at WLS. And one of the things that happens is overnight, she becomes one of the biggest stars in America. And I do mean America, not just in country music. There's a radio survey that's done in 1935 for who is the most popular person on the air. And this magazine puts this survey out. And they were so shocked to come to get the results back that Lula Bell Wiseman, this mountain singer who they, you know, country music has always kind of had this uh reputation in as far as mainstream um, music that country music is always for some reason a little bit um, we'll say down home we'll say that 
um, or it's a little backwards or something like that. So these people were really shocked to get the news that Lula Bell Wiseman from North Carolina on WLS had become the number one highest rated performer, not just female performer, performer in the entire United States. Now, why do we not hear about Lula Bell Wiseman? Well, around 1935, she meets her husband there, another performer from Boone on the National Barn Dance, and they had not known each other growing up, which is interesting. Um, but the Lula Bell and Scotty Wiseman, and you might know of the group Lula Bell and Scotty, um, they were insanely popular in the 1930s, 40s, and early 50s. And um, as you can see here, made some uh, films as well for Republic Pictures. And Lula Bell and Scotty are so popular on the radio that they, uh, like I said, they make films. And the problem is they were so popular on the radio and they were on the radio so much that they didn't really take the time out to make records like somebody would today. You know, like I was saying, due to the depression, people didn't have the income to go and buy records um, where they could just buy a radio and get music for free. So they did make records. I do want to point that out, that they did make some records um, for Sears because WLS was owned by Sears. So synergy was a thing even in the Great Depression. But they make some records for Sears in-house labels that they sold, but not really anything substantial. They didn't record for Victor or they didn't record for, uh, you know, the big uh, record companies. So their popularity was mainly on radio. And one of the things that as collectors, especially of 78s, is you find out that just because a, a person was popular on the radio, a performer was popular on the radio, doesn't necessarily translate into um, down the road because they don't have records uh, everywhere and they don't have many recordings. They made some later on in the 60s and 70s, but not um, not nearly as much in the, in the in their heyday. Uh, you find that over time, these people um, get forgotten about. And Lula Bell Wiseman is definitely one. Of, and that's that will kind of be a theme here for a lot of uh, a lot of this discussion. But Lula Bell Wiseman, uh, along with Scotty Wiseman, are credited for writing some of the most uh, popular songs in country music. And in, in one instance, a standard in the great American songbook, that song is, have I told you lately that I love you. And that song has been recorded many, many times. Everyone from Ella Fitzgerald to that was one of the first songs Ricky Nelson recorded. Um, every, you know, Country singer just about has a recording of it um, out there from Johnny Cash, Ernest Tubb. You can find tons and tons of um, versions of that song. The other song that they wrote that um, has proved to, to be culturally really important was Mountain Dew. And that song, the good, you know, they call it that good old Mountain Dew that every bluegrass band does and every old time act has sung, you know, Grandpa Jones probably has the most famous recording of it. But uh, Lula Bell and Scotty together as a team wrote that song. And um, they their version of it was the very first jingle for the Mountain Dew soft drink. So one of those uh, funny little things that you've heard, you've heard them, you just might not know it. So um, WLS because they have the success with uh, Lula Bell Wiseman, they start hiring all of these other um, acts. And not just Lula Bell Wiseman is on the WLS Barn Dance. Then Gene Autry gets his start on the WLS Barn Dance. Pat Buttram gets his start on the WLS Barn Dance. Even George Goble started on if, and there's a name from uh, long ago, George Goble gets his start on the National Barn Dance. So it's an insanely popular show. So they buy so many hours of it. The show ran for six hours on Saturday night. 
um, including an hour that was, or a half hour that was broadcast on NBC on their radio network that was sponsored by Alka Seltzer. And it was a really important show in the fact that it brought country music, not just mountain type country music, but it also brought Western type music in the case of Louise Massey and the Westerners. Louise Massey and the Westerners were another act on WLS, on the National Barn Dance, who um, had an insanely popular song in 1940 called My Adobe Hacienda. And that was a song that Louise Massey wrote and was an insanely popular, like I said, an insanely popular song. They named a movie after it. Um, and Louise Massey and the Westerners uh, sold tons. This is a group that actually did make records, but were even, even though they sold tons and tons of these 78s back in the 1940, 1941, they still were most popular on the radio. So their records didn't get reissued on, um, on LP and things like that to the extent that um, other artists um, who were, you know, mostly recording artists um, did. So Louise Massey and the Westerners uh, start out as a family band from Oklahoma and or New Mexico. I'm sorry. Um, they start out as a family band and Family bands, like in the case of the Carter family, are a very um, big part of early country music because there was a stigma around performers in general at the time. And a lot of that comes from vaudeville performers and the type of places that they played, that if you were a entertainer in the 1920s and 30s and into the 40s, and you could even say still today, that there was a stigma that you were doing it because you didn't have to work or that you were trying to get something or that you were kind of shady in some aspect. So family bands were a way to kind of, you know, get around that image. And they, they were, as you can see here in this picture, they wore these very nice crisp suits and they were very, very um, nice. And they sing these very, um, nice songs like My Adobe Hacienda. And it was a very big hit. And it was so big a hit that it, along with a song called Pistol Pack and Mama by a, a fellow named Al Dexter, those two songs were enough. The, the record sales of those were enough to convince Billboard that maybe we need a chart for these country records that are coming out for these hillbilly records is what they would call it at the time for these records that are coming out. And um, so because in part of the success of Louise Massey um, and her family um, on the national barn dance, she um, kind of spearheads this campaign to get a country music chart record chart made and that happens in 1941 and not only if this is a little interesting uh fact about the early country music charts not only does it include my adobe hacienda and pistol pack and mama but it also includes records from nat king pole and louis jordan and that was the first time that those artists had ever been uh published in a billboard chart too so very um very interesting um, in all of that, too. Just that could be its own discussion um, in how, you know, country, mu how country music and uh, blues music, there was not as there was not as wide a gap in the 1920s, 30s and 40s as there later was. But um, specifically, one of the interesting things about Louise Massey is unlike Lula Bell Wiseman, who sang these um songs from the mountains she was writing her own um songs primarily and with her family and they were performing um western swing music what would be called western swing music today and so her records were able to cross over into other markets um into the pop world and everything and she uh had a very successful career as a 
singer for um, Tommy Dorsey's band, actually, for a short time. And she actually sang uh, pop music after um, leaving country music for some time and then came back. Um, the fella there with the fiddle, by the way, I'll just say this as a fun anecdote. Um, the fella with the fiddle is named Kurt Massey. And he is the vocalist on the ballad of Jed Clampett that you hear on the Beverly Hillbillies theme song. He's the vocalist for that. Not Lester Flatt, by the way. So anyway, we'll move right along. There's a great picture. As you can see here, they were not interested in preserving an American folk tradition the same way someone like, um, say, another popular act from the radio around this time, the Coon Creek Girls were, or uh, Lula Bell and Scotty was. The Louise Massey and the Westerners were very modern, and that was one of the things that uh, really set them apart from other groups in country music is just how modern and slick they were and professional um, as and just a beautiful rounded sound. And one of the people that was inspired, one of the people that was inspired by their success and how, you know, crisp and polish their sound was, was Jenny Lou Carson. And when we talk about songwriters and we talk about country songwriters, Jenny Lou Carson is a name that doesn't rarely um, come up. And in fact, if you do come to the exhibit, there is a Jenny Lou Carson songbook um, behind me here. Um, she was very popular um, that me and uh, Miss Jessica Stiles have uh, found out there um, in the world. There's if you come here, you can take a closer look at that. But Jenny Lou Carson was country music's first songwriter to really speak about her own life and not in tropes. What I mean by that is take a song by Jimmy Rogers. If you take a song by Jimmy Rogers like, uh, you know, My Rough and Rowdy Ways, he's really singing more as a third person uh, in those songs, if you take a look at the lyrics and, you know, he sings songs about trains and mama and things that we've come to associate with um, country music. Jenny Lou Carson was the first person to really talk about her own experience in country music and her own struggles in her life. And Jenny Lou Carson was also on the WLS Bar and Dance. She started in a group um, as, a tr as a female trio called the Three Little Milkmaids that sang cute little, you know, they were kind of like a uh, the Andrew Sisters meets Little House on the Prairie kind of thing. Um, but Jenny Lou Carson grew tired of that. And she wanted to sing songs that were more about her own personal uh, life and her own personal struggles, which just in general, the record buying public at that time did not really want to hear um, songs about drinking, songs about cheating, songs about things like that, that we come to associate with honky tonk music later on. She was the first person to really delve into that and really be introspective about those um, topics. And among the songs that she wrote were, she wrote very popular songs like Jealous Heart that was made a hit by Tex Ritter and um, countless others. And probably the best known song that she did was a song called Let Me Go Lover um, in the um, 1950s was uh, she originally wrote that as a song about her alcoholism and her struggles with that uh, called Let Me Go Devil. And it was a little bit too much for post-war America to listen to. So they changed it up and kind of turned it into a you know, nice heartbreak song called Let Me Go Lover that in the country world, Hank Snow had a big hit with. And in the pop world, Teresa Brewer had a big hit with. But uh, Jenny Lou Carson, there's a lot more there. And I can't go into uh, go into it right now. But there's a, definitely there's not much information. She didn't make many records. Um, but if you dive into her songs, I can assure you she'll become uh, I can assure you she'll become one of your favorite songwriters. So one of the people that I wanted to talk about uh, as far as big name 
entertainers and real stars in country music that hardly get talked about is Cousin Emmy. And Cousin Emmy is uh, unlike the people that we've been talking about who were in Chicago at WLS. Cousin Emmy bounced around from different station to different station. She was for a time she was in KWKH and Shreveport. She was at WRVA in Richmond and she kind of uh, WWVA in Wheeling. And she just kind of bounced around from different radio program to radio program. And in doing that, she developed a national audience uh, on her own. And I guess the best thing to do is to let Cousin Emmy play for you. And this is a song that is generally associated with Woody Guthrie. But this is a song that she was singing long before Woody Guthrie uh, claimed to have written it or recorded it, for that matter. So here's a uh, listen to Cousin Emmy just for a minute. Of She's playing the banjo on this record on Decca Records from 1947, Lonesome Road Blues. Pops and clicks are to be expected. But anyway, I'll show you the label. Um, you could hear there just how entertaining Cousin Emmy was. And this record is part of the very first album that was recorded, very first female country album. And in case you haven't seen these before, the reason we have the term album is because they are like a photo album in that the records themselves, before LPs and vinyl records, these albums came in sets like photo albums. And so that's where we get the name album. Anyway, this particular record set was uh, recorded by Alan Lomax for the DECA people in 1947 and it shows and it comes with a booklet by the way that has all the words and music so you can play along and uh, some wonderful little illustrations there but this uh, record is important because it is the first um, it is the first country record album if you want to call it that put out by um, a female artist and I, you know, a lot of the things I've been saying is these people didn't really make records the same way that we think about it today. And Cousin Emmy is definitely one of those. Um, in fact, this is the only album in the classic sense um, during her heyday that she put out. Um, she put out a few singles um, on the DECA label and things. But, you know, Cousin Emmy was very popular because she was one of the first people in country music 
to know how to manage her image and know how to manage country music as a industry, you know, long before Nashville was set while Nashville was still trying to get its first publishing houses and stuff out of the ground. She was the, she used to call herself the first hillbilly to own a Cadillac. And she later changed that to the first hillbilly singer to own a house in Beverly Hills. And that's because she was so popular um, back in the 1940s that she starred in movies. And you can see here, this is a lobby card for her uh, film Swing in the Saddle. And she show, she made about a dozen to two dozen of these Westerns. And back in the 40s, back when Westerns were big money makers on the Saturday matinees and everything, we think of people like Gene Autry and Roy Rogers. But uh, Cousin Emmy was right in there with them, making movies, making uh, radio appearances, um, touring. She was a very avid tour. And she you know, was the first person to really take the professionalism of vaudeville and the showmanship that came out of vaudeville and put it into a package for country music that not only country fans could enjoy, but anybody, even if you didn't like country music, you would come home after that show absolutely loving it. Um, you know, kind of this kind of attributes that we kind of attribute to Dolly, uh, Dolly Parton nowadays, you know, you don't have to be a country fan to like Dolly Parton. You hear people say that all the time and, uh, it's been proven true. Cousin Emmy was the first female artist to really, you know, you know, have fans that followed her and, um, really enjoyed what she did. And she was a multi-instrumentalist. Um, played dozens of instruments. And of course, we heard the banjo there. And in this picture, she's uh, playing fiddle and all of that. And she played everything from her, even her own face. Um, she, she plays a paper bag. She plays balloons. I mean, it's just an incredible act. Um, in the 1960s, she started playing at, um, well, after a long stint at Disneyland, actually. Um, she started playing with the new Lost City Ramblers and started making uh, appearances on the folk music circuit. And there's a, there's a television performance of her on YouTube um, if, with the Stanley brothers on the Pete Seeker rainbow quest show. And um, you know, just, you really see how professional uh, cousin Emmy and the Stanley road for that matter, but just really how professional and slick cousin Emmy is and she's the kind of performer that really just kind of outclasses everyone else in the room just she was very good to her fans and uh very to show you how big she was you can see this uh picture here it it's something you know kind of similar she had these police escorts everywhere and she wore fur coats I mean she was really when you hear the term Hollywood hillbilly I mean really you could say that cousin Emmy um is kind of the first person to really run with that and just a fantastic performer, fantastic entertainer. Um, she was very well loved in the 1940s. And um, it's a shame that we don't talk about her more, but that's why we're having these kind of talks. So the next person that I, you know, I've been talking about people that didn't make it big in Nashville, but there's some people that did make it big on the Grand Ole Opry um, and people that were associated with, Nashville and that deserve rec more recognition than they get. In the mid 1930s, you have people like Patsy Montana, who, by the way, was also on WLS. And we know a lot about Patsy Montana. She was featured in that Ken Burns documentary and things. Um, I want to be a cowboy sweetheart. If you don't know Patsy Montana, I'm sure you know that song. One of the things about uh, the Western image is cowgirl really start to become very, very popular. And in the late part of the 1930s and probably the upmost, um, probably the most foremost popular cowgirl singer of the 1930s was Texas Ruby and Texas Ruby, along with her husband, Curly Fox recorded um, from the 1930s to the 1960s. And she was very, very uh, popular in her vocal style was influenced by uh, Bessie Smith, the blues singer. And she had a very low voice that is uh, 
very unique. And let's just give a just let, let's give a listen to a little bit. Here, this is a record that they made for the Star Day people in the 1960s, 1963 actually. And we'll see if we can get it right here on the on the notes. on that record that she had to have influenced Patsy Cline and that beyond that you can just hear how much of a presence that Texas Ruby had um, in her in her uh, in her singing and everything and was very popular on um, on radio Curly Fox and Texas Ruby are one of those acts that actually uh, they stayed in the Grand Ole Opry and probably uh, became known as best known as Opry members. But before that, they had bounced around to a few stations um, in Georgia, WSB in Atlanta, and a few other stations around um, around the country. But Texas Ruby, very interesting. Uh, she kind of is the link between Lula Bell Wiseman that we talked about earlier and Louise Massey in that. She takes the cowgirl image, sings honky tonk songs that you heard there, songs that uh, her act was always changing. It was never stuck, even though, you know, they might have started in the 1930s. You could hear by the 1960s, it was much more aligned with the type of music that was coming out of uh, Nashville in the 1960s. And uh, ever evolving, ever changing, and didn't record enough. And in fact, that record that we heard there, and this is a well-loved copy of this record, as you can see with the tape there, um, less than 72 hours after those that record was made, uh, Texas Ruby died tragically in, um, in a fire at their home in, uh, in Nashville in a mobile home accident, but wonderful, wonderful uh, singer, wonderful rhythm guitar player. Um, I wish we had time to listen to some uh, of her rhythm guitar playing, but fantastic performer all around, Texas Ruby, very well loved by people um, back in the 30s. So to bring it back to Bristol and bring it back to East Tennessee and Southwest Virginia, I wanted to talk about this, uh, one of my favorite singers in country music, period. Molly O'Day was, um, was such a great um, singer, banjo player, guitarist, and just all around uh, performer. You hear her referred to a lot of times if she's referred to now, it's usually as a footnote in the Hank Williams story. And the reason is when Hank Williams first came to Nashville and was writing his first songs for A Cuff Rose, he wrote songs for Molly O'Day. That's how big a star she was. Um, she was on WNOX out of Knoxville on the Midday Merry-Go-Round program. And she was um, someone who not only performed and held up her own band um, and, you know, toured and everything like that. She also was someone that kept alive old ballads. From, um, from her childhood that she heard growing up. Um, and 
you know, with her banjo playing is kind of similar. She plays old time claw hammer banjo, like we heard with um, Texas Ruby or not Texas Ruby, Cousin Emmy. I'm sorry. Um, but really takes the radio medium and the recording medium uh, and really makes it her own. She had this very full throated um, type of singing that was um, so beautiful and so um, so well up. And so she uh, let's take a listen to a song that many have speculated Hank Williams had a hand in writing. Um, this is a song that it says Fred Rose on the label that she recorded for Columbia. And she was someone whose records sold and they sold well. And the reason that her career ended in the early 1950s was she was becoming so popular, she didn't really um, anticipate having all of that fame that she had. So she kind of left the, uh, the music industry um, and became a disc jockey. So uh, let's take a listen to this uh, recording here. Get some of this off the, let's take a listen here. Make sure it's in the right speed. This is a song called The Black Sheep Return to the Fold. She found a lot of success in the gospel market. So let's have a listen for a minute. People took a lot of stuff from those um, from those records, and Molly O'Day probably um, had she kept recording and had uh, she had gone to the Grand Ole Opry, she was actually invited to join. Um, probably we would we would recognize her as a um, as one of the top performers in um, country music history, and she should be. Um, there's a picture of her band there, the Cumberland Mountain Folks. The fellow on the bass is Mac Wiseman for all the bluegrass fans out there. He had his first professional job playing bass for her, as well um, did Carl Smith, who was also. But uh, Molly O'Day, fantastic. I wish we had time to talk about these people more, and they really deserve it. But um, that's uh, go out and check out the record. So I think with that, I will... Um, I will wrap up my discussion. Um, I don't want to run too long winded. So um, thank you for our, um, thank you for, uh, there's some more upcoming events and things. So thanks. Thank you very much, Bailey. And I know we have a few questions that have, we've got some in the chat and also some that I've taken note of from my end. Scotty, do you want to start with the chat questions first? Sure. Um, we've got one from Linda, I think it's Hainsley. Um, was Louise Massey's My Adobe Hacienda in Tejano style, or did it in any way have a Mexican musical style, or did it just use the Mexican lyric with a more mainstream country sound for the time? Uh, that's a good question. The best way I can describe it is um western swing so um very not much of a tejano influence other than you know the word hacienda 
Um, and it's a song that's set in, um, in you know, in a Mexican vignette, right? uh, but very, um, it's a very smooth, you know, type, type song. And it's on YouTube if, uh, if, if anybody would like to listen to it. And it's probably on Spotify too. Okay. Um, and then we also have one from David Winship. Anything about Judy Canova? Oh, Judy Canova. That's, you know, I actually thought about possibly including her. Judy Canova it was a very popular radio comedian in the 1930s and 40s and into the 1950s. And she had, um, along with a fellow named Bob Burns, um, had this hillbilly uh, act that was very popular and very influential to Minnie Pearl. And if you if, if you think about Minnie Pearl, um, Judy Canova is very similar. She predates Minnie Pearl, actually. But um, the, the reason I didn't include Judy Canova was musically, she was more um, into the pop realm. She was more of a, uh, a mainstream type performer in vaudeville and things like that. But good, good. I like the Judy Canova. <laughs> and there's one more in the chat right now um, from Carol Westlake. I can't see very well. Um, was Mac Wiseman related to Lula Bell Wiseman? Not that I know of. Um, I know there's been people that have speculated that. Um, Mac Wiseman is from Virginia and Lula Bell Wiseman was from North Carolina. But um, the short answer is not that I know of. Cool. And I think Renee said she has a couple. Yes. So I, I'm here with three other people. So we have one question about um, you mentioned, and I can't remember which singer it was you were talking about. It might have been Lula Bell Wiseman about the Mountain Dew song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I get the first question is, is, I wasn't sure that I that I understood this. Was that actually a song that she did for a jingle or a song that was turned into a jingle? Song that was turned into a jingle. But but that was quite a common thing on live radio where you're having live because you know it's not like radio today where they're playing recordings. It's live people in the studio mm -hmm. performing, kind of like we sometimes do on Radio Bristol. But they were also doing a lot of those live jingles. Am I right? Yes, um, Lula Bell Wiseman. One of her. Um, sticks, I guess you could say, um, was they, they were on a segment sponsored by, I think, uh, some, some chewing gum, uh, maybe been Wrigley's. We'll, we'll go with Wrigley's, but anyway, they did this jingle for this gum company and she would chew gum during the whole set and she would chew a huge wad of gum and pull it out during the jingle and may, and it would tear the audience up. And um, and it was just, you know, something that became kind of a trademark. Um, it started as you know, as an accident, but then it turned into one of the hallmarks of their thing and all that kind of thing. And then my second question was, um, could you tell us a little bit about the Dezurich sisters? Because oh, I'm interested yeah. in them because of their yodeling. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, the Dezurich sisters... Um, also known as the Cackle Sisters on WSM, on WLS, they were known as the Dessert Sisters, and they um, had these very unique yodeling style where they would imitate birds and imitate like chickens and things like that in their um, yodeling. A lot of their music is actually, uh, you can probably guess from the Dessert name, is actually um, polka influenced. And so they're an interesting link, very popular in the Midwest um, country um, music and on WLS and later WSM in Nashville. Yeah, they're kind of wild to listen to. <laughs> very, very unique. Do we have any more questions? We have, um, we have a comment. Oh, yeah. So we have a comment from Lydia um, from earlier. I saw a droopy dog cartoon on TV the other morning um, that featured a singing cowgirl, clearly like Patsy Montana. The cartoon is Wild and Wooly from 1945. According to a friend of mine, the cowgirl is singing um, Hamblin's Texas Plains, which Montana performed all the time until she wrote, I want to be a cowboy sweetheart um and 
she thought that we might be interested if we don't know already and posted a link in the chat. She says it's a hoot. I do know that. I do know that cartoon. I can tell you who animated the um, the the cowgirl was a fellow named Preston Blair, and it's not Patsy Montana singing. It um, it's a staff. Some people have speculated that it was actually Ju Judy Canova, and some actually thought for a while it could be Louise Massey. But it's one of those things that I there isn't really any real documentation of it. Um, and I have animation friends that could probably shed a little bit more light on that, but, uh, I do know that cartoon and, um, that's one of my, it's, that's one of my favorites, the Tex Avery cartoon who was from Texas. So, yeah, um, I'm a big Tex Avery fan and I've got some cartoon and some animated friends too, Bailey. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. And Bailey, that's something that the rest of the audience might not know, but you also know quite a lot about Looney Tunes and old cartoons. Am I right? So maybe that's maybe that's a future talk. Maybe about maybe so. music there's, and cartoons. <laughs> there's more overlap than you think there with country music and especially this early radio stuff. Um, there's a lot of overlap in those two worlds. So. Yeah, I can collaborate with you on that one. And we actually do have two more quick ones that popped up. Um, Sheldon Timmon asks, were the albums all, all recordings done at the same time or past hits of the artist? So like best of kind of things? Is that? Um, well, the, the best answer for that is um, it depends. In the case of the two albums that I've, featured this this one from Curly Fox and Texas Ruby and the Cousin Emmy one. Those were all done at the same time. Um, but for other 78 album sets at the time, um, so like especially for big names like uh, you know, Tommy Dorsey or Harry James or something like that, most of the time it would be a compilation. And here's a chance for you uh, to plug your show. Carol Westlake asks, how do we listen to Bailey George on the radio? Well, you can uh, tune us in at 100.1 FM if you're in Bristol. Otherwise, tune in um, Wednesdays from 3 to 5, so tomorrow um, from 3 to 5, right before Scotty's show, actually. Um, and uh, it, it's called the Honky Tonk Hip Parade, and it's uh, – all this type of stuff that we've been talking about tonight and lots more um, fun and surprises. Um, and you can tune that in at listenradiobristol.org. And uh, yeah, so I hope you tune in tomorrow. Yeah, it's a great show. You should definitely all check it out. Um, and you can, did you mention the internet? You can also stream it. Um, if you go to the birthplaceofcountrymusic.org website and go to the radio link, you can go to the um, program shows and all the archives are there. And an app. There's also an app, too. There's yeah. also an app where you can live stream it if you're out of um, radio frequent frequency range. Um, yeah, and I just want to repeat what Scotty said in case people didn't understand. But if you go to our website, like he said, to the radio site, you can also check out archived shows. So, if you don't catch Bailey on the day, you can listen to him after the fact. <laughs> yeah. And you can stream from there live as well. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. And we did have one private. Um, I got a private message from Michael cousin saying that he wants the Looney Tunes. So that sounds like that's a talk for the future, Bailey. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll get, I'll get on that. Yeah. Already. yeah that, I'm ex I'd be excited about that one. Yeah. We've, we've had another person chime in and say, yes. <laughs> Well, there, you'd be surprised how much of this stuff turns up. Yeah. Well, so yeah. that's one of my questions. Um, before I turn it over to Renee, just I want to say great job, Bailey, and thanks thank everyone you. for attending. Yeah, and I want to say thank you to Bailey, too, and for everyone. And if Bailey, if you don't mind to share your screen one more time, I want to tell people about some of oh. our upcoming events that they might be interested in. Absolutely. Here we are. And I think there was one more. Yeah, there's one before that. Okay. There we 
perfect. So just for those of you who have joined us tonight and have enjoyed this virtual speaker series, we have, um, these will be going on every month for the rest of the year, but we can tell you what the next three are so you can plan your schedule around them. On March 2nd at 7 p.m., we have Alona Norwood and William Issam II, who will be doing a talk on the work of Black in Appalachia, uncovering and sharing regional Black narratives. Then on April 6th at 7 p.m., we have Lydia Hammersley, who has been one of our audience tonight. So welcome, Lydia, who will be doing a talk about her book, Unlikely Angels, The Songs of Dolly Parton. And then on May 4th, 20, May 4th, I don't know why I put 2021 instead of 7 p.m., but 7 p.m., we're going to have Pat Jarrett from the Virginia Folklife Program, and that topic is to be confirmed. But it's we think it's going to be him pulling some really interesting things out of their archives to share with us. Um, like I said, this is a monthly speaker series. It's always going to be the first Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m., and it is always a free program that just needs pre-registration on Zoom. So we hope that you all can make it to some of those. And then if you don't mind going to the next slide, Bailey. For those of you who are interested in the radio, ba um, Bailey's told you about how to access his show on Wednesdays. But Scotty and I also have a show. It's called Museum Talk with Renee and Scotty, and that is on Thursdays at 11 to 12, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., where we talk to different museum folks across the country and even in other countries about the work that they're doing. We um, advocate for, for museums. We share some interesting little facts and figures about museums, and we also um, are there to answer your questions about museums. Um, and we have on February 11th, we'll be talking to Abby Young, who is the Director of Education at the Durham Museum in Omaha, Nebraska. And then on February 18th, it'll be just Scotty and I talking about museum heists. Um, think the Thomas Crown Affair. And then um, on the fourth Thursday of each month, instead of museum talk, we do Radio Bristol Book Club, where we discuss a book with several book readers and often have an author interview. And the February Book Club on 20, the 25th of February is The Devil's Dream by Lee Smith, which has a lot of of ties to our local history here because it's very loosely based on the story of the Carter family. And then finally, on the first and third Fridays of each month, we are now doing um, story time, virtual story time. We're releasing those on social media and then putting them up on our website. Um, they are for mostly um, lower elementary kids, but also for the young at heart. And all of the books are set either in Appalachia or from Appalachian authors or have a music focus content. And our um, February 5th, so this Friday is How Chipmunk Got His Stripes, which is based on a Native American folktale. And February 19th, we have the coat, we have Coat of Many Colors by Dolly Parton. So there are lots and lots of things to look forward to. And the only other thing I'll say before I say thank you one last time is that I will be sending out a survey in the next day or so about your experience. And we would love your feedback. So please share that with us. But most of all, I want to say a big thank you once again to Bop and Bailey George for a really fascinating talk. I think you had everyone in the palm of your hands with that one, Bailey, and everyone enjoyed okay. the music. So um, we really, we really got a lot out of it. And also a thank you to everyone who stayed with us on a Tuesday night, on a cold Tuesday night for this wonderful event. Hope to see you again soon. All right. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.